The following talk was given at the Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, California. Please visit our website at audiodharma.org. Uh, so it's uh, our fortune to have Bhikkhu Bodhi here today. And uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi is a Buddhist monk, been a monk for some 35, close to 40 years. Um, and um, was ordained in Sri Lanka many years ago. And he is one of the preeminent uh, Theravadan monks here in the West, um, in big part because he's been a, a, uh, the, one of the main translators of the Buddha's teachings, Buddha's words, the suttas. Uh, he's done a lot already, and he's continuing to do a lot. He has another book coming out, hopefully, end of next year, of the, um, the uh, are you calling it the Connected Discourses still? I mean, I mean the numerical discourses? Incremental? And um, <clears throat> he's also written extensively commentary and uh, teachings uh, based on the teachings of the Buddha and uh, has been a very um, prolific and creative and wonderful teacher for many of us. And it's a very privilege to have him here. And what brought him here this year is that um, two years ago he started uh, kind of the first Western Buddhist international relief agency. And uh, he noticed that... Uh, there really was a dramatic shortage of uh, such uh, Buddhist-based uh, relief agencies to go into the world with times of crisis and famine and places. And, um, and uh, he thought it was time to start one. And so he did, and that's been uh, uh, started with great success. It's called the Buddhist Global Relief. And uh, yesterday, he, we did a day-long uh, benefit for his uh, Buddhist Global Global Relief Organization here at IMC. And uh, today, all the teacher dana, uh, if you make a donation for Bhikkhu Bodhi teaching today, will also go to the Buddhist Global Relief. <clears throat> if you write a check, you could write it out to that. It says it on the, on the table there. And if you're interested to know a little bit more about uh, the Buddhist Global Relief, there are some... Um, are, there, are there pamphlets out there? There's pamphlets out on the table. And let me introduce you to uh, two members of their board, which is um, Sylvie and then uh, Kim and uh, they'd be happy to if, answer questions you have about what they're doing and the wonderful work they've been doing around the world and um, and um, so it's a great privilege to have you here again thank you very much Bika Bodhi Calibrated discourses of the Buddha. <laughs> For months, I've been, <laughs> I've been envisioning the cover <laughs> incremental discourses of the Buddha. And now, in one fit of laughter, <laughs> It's been crossed out. <laughs> and just a question mark hangs in there. <laughs> okay, I'll begin in the traditional way by paying homage to the Buddha. Namo. Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato 
Sama Sambuddhasa. Good morning, everybody. Is my voice carrying into the far regions of the <laughs> back hall? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. If anybody is having tr- trouble hearing, could you just raise your hand? Okay, so the sound, sound system is all right. And for those that I didn't meet yesterday, I'm very happy to get acquainted with you today, even though it resulted in a, <laughs> a bit of disillusionment for me. <laughs> Okay, the subject that I'll speak about um, this morning is how to deal with pain in meditation. Because this is a problem that many people have. Some people have it in what we might call a discretionary way, which means that when one gets pain in the legs or the back when practicing meditation, one has the option of readjusting the posture so that the pain will go away, at least temporarily. But then there are other people who have, you might call, non-discretionary pain, and that this is a painful condition that is always with us, and that we have to deal with constantly in our everyday life, as well as in meditation. I am a person who belongs to the second category, (laughs) since I've had for almost from the third year of my monastic life, when I, 1976, up to the present, a kind of chronic head pain condition. And so I've had to find ways to deal with this, both in my everyday life as well as in meditation. First, I'll give a little background about how this problem started, not in order to (laughs) speak out of a kind of confession of (laughs) self-pity, (laughs) But just to give you a little spotlight on the particular problem, then I'll explain some of the ways that I've dealt with this and some of the more general ways that people can deal with pains that arise in meditation or in everyday life. Okay, I went to Sri Lanka to become a monk in towards the end of 1972. And in early 1976, I started my first major translation project. I was then living with the German monk named Venerable Jana Punika, who is the president and founder of the Buddhist Publication Society in Kandy, and the a long-term translator of Buddhist texts, both in English and German. And also he was the writer of one of the most influential early books on meditation, Buddhist meditation, called The Heart of Buddhist Meditation. It was actually that book that first introduced me to the Theravada system of mindfulness meditation way back in 1967 when I was still a graduate student. And I had saw that the author, in his preface, he put the place where the book was written, he said, Jnana Ponika Terra, Forest Hermitage Candy. And that name of the place, Forest Hermitage, somehow it evoked romantic images in my mind, a kind of deep attractive force on my mind. And this was before I had any idea that I would wind up going to Sri Lanka. <laughs> and yet somehow through the strange working of the <clears throat> patterns of causes and conditions. Not only did I wind up going to Sri Lanka, but within my first month there, I met Venerable Nyanaponika Tara at, on a, at a different place. And eventually he wound up, when a room opened up at the Forest Hermitage, he invited me to come there to live and to do my Dharma studies and practice. And he had suggested to me that I do a translation of the first sutta in the Sutta Pitaka, which is called the Brahmajala Sutta, which I translated as the Discourse on the All-Embracing Net of Views. (laughs) (laughs) 
And I had just started to work on this translation, maybe I was about a month into it, when I started to get these pains around my eyes when I was reading. And I thought maybe the pain came because I was reading too much, and especially sometimes this was coming into the rainy, the actual rainy period in Sri Lanka, early March when clouds form in the afternoon. And so I stopped reading during when the light was bad. In the, those days, we didn't have electric lights in the forest hermitage. At night for light, we would depend on kerosene lamps. And during the day, we would just have to work by the natural daylight. And so it, what, <laughs> maybe it's difficult for Americans to believe this, but it's, it's actually the condition. And so I would, whenever the sky would become cloudy and the light would become bad, then I would stop reading and just work during the time when the sun was bright. But as time went on, over the next two months or so, even when the sun was bright and shining, I would get these severe pains around the eyes whenever I would focus on print until it reached a point by May 1976, this is about four months after the problem started, where I couldn't read at all. Whenever I would focus on print after about three or four minutes, such extreme pain would come in the eyes that I would just have to stop. And I'd gone to see first ophthalmologists, eye specialists. They couldn't find anything seriously wrong with the eyes. They suggested that I see the ENT specialist because it was discovered that there was a connection between the sinuses and the eyes, so they thought the problem could be in the sinuses. And the ENT specialists couldn't find anything wrong. They suggested I go see neurologists. I would go see the neurologist. They could find nothing wrong. And they would suggest that I go see another ophthalmologist. And this was going sort of in a circle over a period of from May until about October 1976, I went to stay in the hospital. There was a small vihara, Buddhist vihara, in the central hospital in Colombo. And I was staying with the, the monk who was running the hospital service, the Buddhist hospital service there, and seeing various doctors. And nothing really worked out. And I was planning to leave Colombo leave the hospital vihara two days later. But then the evening before I was supposed to leave, the monk who was running the hospital service, his name was Venerable Vipassi, told me that he had been speaking to a doctor who was himself hospitalized, who heard about my condition and he wanted to speak to me. And I told him, Bhante, I've seen too many doctors already Nothing has done any good. I do want to leave and go back to Candy. So I'll just um, bypass your suggestion. But Venerable Vipassi said, you should see this doctor. He seems to be very knowledgeable and he really wants to speak to you. So I said, okay, I'll go speak to him. And this doctor told me that he had met some cases similar to mine and what he found is that the cause of the eye problem is actually in the sinuses. What happens is that a layer of mucus forms and it gets compressed and dried out and becomes very, very uh, so thin that it doesn't show up in x-rays. And he had found a method to treat that. And so what he prescribed to, to me was to do a course of treatment using a decongestant spray several times a day, keeping the head upside down as the spray flows through the nostrils, uh, through the sinuses, and several other medications. And so I took his advice, I stayed on at the hospital, and I did this for about a week. After a week, 
the eyes, the area around the eyes was becoming extremely painful, so painful that I could almost not tolerate it anymore. And I went to the doctor and reported this, and he said, good. <laughs> not that he's a, a sadist, but he explained to me that what is happening is that that mucus is starting to expand. It's absorbing the medication, starting to expand. And he said, just continue with it patiently. Then over the next week, I started to uh, spit out large masses of mucus. And it continued like this for a week, even two weeks. And then the pain around the eyes disappeared. And again, like a miracle, I was able to look at print and it seemed unbelievable. I could look at print for 10, 15 minutes, half an hour, and no pain. <laughs> you know, I'd never, I hadn't been able to do that since about March of that year. So this is the first time in about nine months that I could look continuously at print. <laughs> but I still noticed um, a kind of dull pain, not so in the area close around the eyes, but above the eyebrows and underneath the lower part on the cheeks. And I told this to the doctor, and he said that he had done everything that he could prescribe for me and that he didn't know himself how to deal with this problem. And he suggested that I see what's called an Ayurvedic physician, that is a physician in the field of herbal medicine, Sri Lankan traditional herbal medicine which is derived from the Indian Ayurvedic system. So for several months I took the Ayurvedic medicine, but it didn't help with the problem. Then I came back to the USA in 1977. I saw an ENT specialist. He directed me to take, he said I probably have allergies, that I take these anti-allergy injections. I wound up taking anti-allergy injections for about a year and eight months. They didn't have any effect. In 1982, I went back to Sri Lanka. Back in Sri Lanka, I tried one type of treatment after another, going in the cycle from Western medicine to Ayurvedic medicine to homeopathy, back to Western medicine. <laughs> I went up to Tibet to see, not to Tibet, I'm sorry, but to Dharamsala to see Dr. Yeshi Dundin, who was formerly the personal physician of the Dalai Lama. And I took Tibetan medicine for three months. It didn't help. Came back to Sri Lanka and continued in the cycle all the way through without being able to solve this problem of head pain. And then after I, I came back in let's see, March 2001, the head pain, it would go through fluctuations over the years, sometimes very strong, sometimes it would lighten up. But in March 2001, <clears throat> the pressure in the head became so strong that I was virtually not doing anything but just sitting in my chair, sort of my armchair in the downstairs room. After breakfast, I would just sit in the chair and remain sitting there for like three and a half hours till lunchtime, eat lunch, take a little rest after lunch, then go down and sit in the armchair again <laughs> till sunset would come. Um, but about that time, some people in Singapore heard about this problem and they invited me to come to Singapore. So I went to Singapore, I took treatment there, it wasn't successful. And there I took Western type treatment, acupuncture, um, Chinese herbal medicine, various other um, non-conventional treatments, including Bali chakra healing, <laughs> spirit psychic readings. And then I came back to the United States in 2002, May 2002, and I've remained here since then. Um, I've been taking treatment from a place called the Headache Institute in New York. It's Western medicine. And there's a certain medication that I take that it helps to ameliorate the pain, perhaps about 25, 30%. So if I don't take this medication, 
the pain increases to such an extent that I'm almost incapacitated. Um, but while I'm taking it, the pain is reduced sufficiently that I can remain more or less functional. <laughs> And sometimes there are fluctuations in the intensity of the pain. Sometimes, even when taking the medication, it will become very strong for a couple of days where I just can do almost nothing but lie down. Then it will come back to the normal level where I can begin functioning again. Fortunately, these days it's been at a moderate level so that I could function. But because of this problem, over the years I've had to discover in order to maintain any type of meditative life, I have to find some way to deal with the pain in the course of meditation. When I first began meditation back, well actually I started when I was still in graduate school, but when, when I came to Sri Lanka, I was using primarily either mind, mindfulness of breathing around the nostrils, and sometimes the rise and fall of the abdomen, according to the Burmese system. And what I, as this pain, painful condition developed, I found that the pain in the head would be an obstruction to my focus on the point of concentration, either the nostrils or the rising and falling. And I consider this an obstacle to the meditation but in, towards the end of 1979, when I was in the United States, I did a retreat at Insight Meditation Society in Barry, and Joseph Goldstein was conducting the retreat. And he gave me some advice which was extremely helpful. And he said, take the sensation of the head pain as your object of attention. And so I would begin the meditation by using the rise and fall of the abdomen as the point of focus. And then what would be the usual pattern is that I would begin, you know, with fairly good concentration on the rise and fall of the abdomen. But to the extent that the mind became focused on the rise and fall, the awareness of the pain in the head would increase to the point it would deflect my attention from the movement of the abdomen. So what I discovered through the advice of Joseph Goldstein was at that point to shift the attention to the sensations in the head and just observe them as sensations. And it became an extremely interesting and even like powerful subject of meditation because what I discovered is that one begins by paying attention to the area where one feels the pain. So this is the area in the head. And as one is focusing on that area, one starts, as the mind becomes more subtle, more sensitive, one begins to get an awareness of the sensations throughout the whole body. So that at a certain point, the whole body turns into, they call it a mass of sensations. The, <laughs> the area that's always clamoring for attention, of course, is the area where the pain is concentrated. But one could feel sensations throughout the whole body. And then as one is observing the sensations, especially those in the area of the head where one is experiencing the pain, one begins to see that what we call pain is a kind of label that is applied to a particular experience and there's a distinction between the label and the actual experience, which doesn't mean that the experience is pleasant. In a way, it's painful and that it does cause some kind of sensations that the body naturally recoils from, that the mind doesn't like. But what one does is simply observe these sensations, painful sensations, and just as one continues to observe them, or what one is labeling as pain, pain, turns into almost like a constellation of little, do you know the pointless paintings of, 
who is the pe- famous pointless? Surat, Surat, where from a distance you see the image of the woman carrying the parasol and the gentleman by her side walking along the, in this park. But then when you come up close and get within um, maybe about a foot of the picture, you don't see the image of the woman, the man, the parasol, the park anymore, but just little points of paint. And so what I found is that as one is observing the sensation of what we call pain, it sort of dissolves into little point sensations of, well, into little points of sensations that we're labeling painful. But it became just extremely interesting simply to observe them and as one goes on observing them, what one finds is that not only is that mass of painful sensation, does, not only does it dissolve into points of sensation, but those points of sensation are always changing. They're arising, passing, arising, passing, arising, passing. And then the sensations through the whole body as one extends the awareness from this area around the head through the whole body, one sees that those sensations too are arising and passing. And so what we call the my body turns in experientially into a mass of sensations that are always arising and passing. And so one effective method that I found of dealing with the pain is to turn the attention to that painful area. And I also found that useful to a large extent, not perfectly, with the pain that arises in the legs or the buttocks as one is sitting in meditation. And so during a period I spent in Sri Lanka at a place called Mitarigala Nisaranavanya Aranya. It's a meditation hermitage where I did a long extended retreat during a vas, a rainy season. You know, as I was sitting, then painful sensations would come in the legs. Or in my case, not so much this part of the leg, but the buttocks. Then I would just direct the attention there and just watch. You know, normally when one gets that pain, one thinks, if you, the word that I would use, it's not proper to use in a meditation center. But <laughs> <laughs> Drat! <laughs> Here I am, my concentration is getting better and better. And you, you damn bones, you're not cooperating. <laughs> And so the, you know, first the pain starts a little bit, you know, it's like a voice calling in the distance, you know, like your mother calling you for coming for dinner, Jeffrey, Jeffrey. <laughs> but then when you still continue to play stickball or football out on the street, the voice gets louder, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, come for dinner. <laughs> so it's like the voice of the pain in the leg starting a little bit, pain, 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 and then you're wondering, what's that? And then you're aware, okay, there's a pain there. And then, you know, that's what you're taught. When you feel pain, just label it pain. And, you know, you think labeling it pain should make it go away. <laughs> <laughs> but after labeling it pain a few times, you know, it doesn't go away. <laughs> Not only doesn't it go away, but it keeps on calling out more and more loudly, pain, 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 till it can get sometimes really strong. And so the temptation is to change the posture. But the meditation teacher tells you, when the pain starts, even when it's getting stronger, don't be such a, in such a hurry to change the posture. Stay with it. And so one stays with it until the pain becomes really strong. So I'm supposed to be following the breath, the rise and fall of the abdomen, so it's rising. Pain, 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 pain. Not falling because, you, you know, you miss the falling because of the pain. So it's a few 
breaths later, rising, 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 then it's maybe three or four breaths later that falling, 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 but in between was all of that pain. So then what I found is useful to do is to shift the attention from just drop the rising and falling or the breathing in and out and just observe the sensation in the legs or in the buddhaks and just put the mind right there. And this pain would then become stronger than the pain in the head. (laughs) Not even aware that I have the head pain anymore. (laughs) So just watching the pain, and then it turns into kind of like a current of painful sensations, you know, arising, passing, arising and passing. Interestingly, sometimes that pain will become stronger, so it's really powerful. Then as one is observing it, it will lighten up a little bit, when it lightens up a little bit, then one can go back to rising and falling, but it doesn't disappear, but then it starts reaching a new crescendo, building up again, reaching a new crescendo. And what I found at a certain point, when really persisting, that there would come a point where the pain in the legs actually breaks. Not the leg, it's the pain that breaks. And somehow the leg manages to settle into the new position and there is no pain anymore in, in this part of the body. And then one can go back to the main object. <laughs> but then what happens after one gets into that settled and comfortable position with the legs, after could be 15 minutes, 20 minutes, again the pain starts coming back. So it has to alternate in this way between observing the pain and observing either the rise and fall, or in my case it would be the sensations in the head and then the rest of the body. Okay, another method that I found, I have to use like different methods on different occasions according to the intensity of the pain, exactly the way it's affecting the body. So another method that I found of dealing with the head pain is simply to be aware of the body as a whole. So instead of focusing in closely on the pain in the area of the head where I experience it, at a certain point, just let the attention come away from that area and then take in the body as one experiences it as a whole. And so when this, in this case, the sense of the body doesn't become immediately clear, but one has to continue with it, persist with it over some time, and then one gets the sense, the kind of mindfulness of the whole body builds up a momentum until one can experience the body as a concrete or composite whole. So that is another technique of dealing with pain. This works, I found that it works to some extent with the head pain. I don't know how it would work with the leg pain. I think with the leg pain, of course one should maintain the the legs in the sitting posture as long as possible until it becomes really unbearable, then one should change the leg position. One shouldn't cause oneself to experience too much pain. But then another, still another method that I found of dealing with the pains in the body while one is sitting in meditation, and this is perhaps not the technique to be used by relative beginners, but after one has gotten experience, or a quiet experience, sitting with the bodily sensations, to turn the attention to the mind itself, just away from the body, and just observe the mind, and observe whatever states of mind are arising, occurring, and passing away. And this becomes extremely interesting because you know, usually we are just so identified with our thoughts, with our emotions, our feelings, that we don't have, well, we become so identified with them that we just take them to be the center of our being and we become involved in all of our little dramas, turmoils, or 
when you're writing a book and giving an odd title to it, our little, <laughs> little comedies. <clears throat> but what one does in this approach to, to mindfulness is simply to be aware of what states of mind are occurring so that one is becoming an almost the objective or one is taking the standpoint of the pure subject observing one's thoughts, emotions, intentions as objects, turning them into objects. And so then one finds that the thoughts, intentions, emotions, especially those that can cluster around painful feelings, lose their momentum. You know, they build up a certain impetus, a certain momentum, when one is identifying with them, but when one turns them into pure objects, then they become just phenomena that are occurring. States that arise, one looks at them, when initially one can identify this kind of thought, that kind of thought, this kind of emotion, this kind of emotion. But because one is just observing and noting them, they don't flow into successive thoughts or successive emotions which build upon them. So that one, normally we, one thought, one emotion flows into the next so that we construct whole worlds based on these thoughts and emotions and whole ways of orientation towards the world. But when one takes this purely sub standpoint of the pure subjective observer of one's mind, then the thoughts become very shy, you could say, a little bit afraid to appear out or to claim the center of the stage, you know, the hero of the drama. But they become, all the thoughts become a little bit like the side men, the side actors, with very minor roles to perform. You know, just the guys that walk across the stage when there's a procession. <clears throat> and so then these thoughts lose their sort of subjective character, which comes from identifying with them as I and mine, and building upon these notions of I and mine. And all one sees is the arising and passing of mental states, just like you are sitting by the shore of an ocean, just watching one wave flow up, rise up, crash against the shore, followed by the next wave, the next wave, the next wave. But the ocean will continue according to the force of its currents. But when one is observing the mind, what happens is at a certain point, the mind just settles down and becomes still and quiet. And there remains just, it seems that there remains just the observer, but any kind of objective content appears only seldom only relatively rarely, and it doesn't build up a force of momentum. Okay, and one other benefit that I've found personally from this long experience of pain is that it really serves to build up within oneself compassion. Because when one is strong and healthy, it's difficult to know how other people who are afflicted with long-term, painful, chronic illnesses feel. But when I found, when I had this, well, I still have it, but when I was in Sri Lanka with this headache condition, often I would have to go to the hospital and I would see, you know, Sri Lankan hospitals, very different from a hospital in the West. Here in America, you make the appointment with a doctor. Your appointment is maybe, let us say, 10.30 a.m. You come to the office, maybe there are three or four other people sitting in the office. When 10.30 a.m. comes, you get called into the doctor's office. You have 15 minutes with the doctor. Um, you could really speak about your condition at length. And then the doctor will prescribe whatever medicine you need. But in Sri Lanka, these, it has a, a shame on America, but Sri Lanka has a kind of socialized medical service so people will come from remote villages to the city hospitals in order to be seen by a doctor. And so the doctors have to give each patient three minutes 
to hear their story, diagnose it in their mind, and write out the prescription. And I would see the lines, long lines of people, poor, simple-looking women, maybe with their babies, elderly men, um, sometimes men on like crutches uh, or walking sticks. And as a monk in a country like Sri Lanka, I have a certain privilege. Like when the monk comes to the line, the doctor's assistants, attend attendants, will sort of usher the monk to come in at the front of the line. And I, I didn't like that. You know, I felt I should be stand my turn, but that would be to go against the culture of the country. And so I can't uphold my <laughs> American democratic egalitarian ideal in a country which gives special attention and respect to monastics. But I would see how much trouble people go through and how the body is subject to so much illness and so much um, infirmities. And when I was staying in the Colombo hospital with monk in charge of the Sri Lank of the Colombo, the hospital, Buddhist hospital service, I would often go on the patient rounds with him. And we would go to see patients who were suffering from such drastic, such dreadful illnesses, you know, people with cancer, advanced cancer, people who have had heart attacks, people with ex advanced diabetes, people who had lost arms, legs in the automobile accidents and so on. And I came to feel like <laughs> my head pain condition, <laughs> for me it was a big thing, but when I saw this it seemed like almost like nothing compared to what these people go through. And I really came to feel like a very deep sense of empathy and compassion for them. And this is, in a way, what gradually simmered in my mind that led to the forming of Buddha's global relief, a wish to help the people in these poor parts of the world. And even though these people are poor, as a monk, if one goes on alms round, they will always find food to offer. Okay, maybe should we have, I don't know what the time schedule will be. If you can just stop now. Um, oh. Okay, okay. If anybody has any question, please feel welcome to ask. I see one in the back, yeah. Thank you for your complete and intimate explanation, description of pain in, in your life and in meditation. Mm -hmm. you, you came to this study of pain personally. Does, how does that match the description in the suttas of all these things that you've been reading and translating that describe presumably similar things? Okay, well, the treatment of feeling comes within, like one of the main sources is the Satipatthana Sutta. And the method of the suttas, because they were a body of oral literature, they were not, the methods of contemplation are not presented in elaborate detail, but they're presented in the form of almost like formulas. And so one has to build on the formulas to know how to apply their advice in actual practice. So what one finds in the Satipatthana Sutta says that simply when the monk is feeling pain, he's aware, I'm feeling pain. And so sometimes I would use that as a kind of key for the contemplation of pain. So just when feeling pain, just feel the pain. And then there's another passage which says, there is, or else his mindfulness and knowledge are set up only to the extent there is feeling. And so whatever feeling arises, I would observe simply as feeling. When it's, even when it's painful feeling, just don't even label it as pain, but just observe it as a kind of feeling that's occurring. And then the text also says he observes 
feeling internally, feeling externally, both internally and externally. This has always been something of a puzzling passage because you know, I can't feel the feelings of others. I can't feel directly the feelings of others. But the way I understand this is that what one does is a kind of inferential understanding that just as I am experiencing certain feelings, all other living beings are also experiencing feelings like this. But then it comes into the section, he contemplates in the body, he contemplates in regard to feelings, the arising, the feelings nature of arising and feelings nature of cessation or passing away. And so this is what I found when almost by itself, I didn't even make the deliberate attempt to observe the arising of feeling and the passing away of feeling, but just as I was observing the feelings occurring, suddenly at a certain point it occurred to me, wow, these feelings are arising and they're passing. They're arising and they're passing. Now I wasn't trying deliberately to take, this is what the text says, so apply it to my own experience. But it was more like I had read the text, okay, now I'm undertaking this practice and experiencing this. Then after like after some time of experiencing it, then suddenly one realizes, wow, that's what the text is talking about. Hi, Hi. thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I do experiencing uh, in my body uh, like similar, like similar mm -hmm. pain. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, so I cannot sit much, yeah. and so I'm so happy to hear mm. what your mm. descriptions and i'm wondering if you have a online uh, guided meditation with this kind of pain i haven't done that myself but i found some years ago somebody sent me a set of i think it, in those days they were tapes but it's probably now in cd there's somebody named shinzen young or he used to be called Stephen Young, now he has the name Shinzen. It was a two, I think it was two tapes on dealing with pain. And I found them very, very useful. And they're available through Sounds True. Mm -hmm. Through Sounds True. So thank you very much, Bhikkhu Bodhi, yeah. for coming and oh, thank for, you. The, for the talk. And uh, we're now going to have the potluck. Mm -hmm. And again, anybody, everybody's welcome to stay. And if you're new to our community, um, if you were at all inclined to turn to someone and uh, introduce yourself, say hello, and people are friendly here. and uh, and. Uh,